Okay, the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 2225 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy on International Day of Disabled People. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I would ask members who wish to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible or place an R in the chat function. And I call on Pam Duncan Glancy to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. There are moments in all of our lives when we feel the need to pinch ourselves, and I have to say today for me is one of those moments. Not only do I feel honoured and proud, as I always do, to be a disabled person and to celebrate disabled people and our organisations world over, but I am incredibly proud and grateful to be able to celebrate our collective fight from this chamber, having secured a members' debate today on International Day of Disabled People, which is tomorrow. What an absolute privilege it is to open this debate. In my first ever speech to this parliament, I paid tribute to the disability movement, and today I want to do that again and to expand on it. The theme for this year's day is leadership and participation in a post-COVID world. I want to dedicate my time today to the fights the incredible disability movement, of which I'm proud to be part, have led and won, and the fights we are yet to win. It is the endless struggle and, yes, the suffrage throughout history of this movement that are the reason that these days exist, that we are able to celebrate them and harness them to promote and improve the human rights of disabled people across the country and the world. But as I'm sure we'll all agree, disabled people's rights are human rights every single day of the year. We in this chamber owe it to those who have fought for their right to exist, not even live a life, to fight for it too every day. This past year has been tough for all of us, but for disabled people who have had their rights and freedoms stifled and stopped by a system that fought against them, rather than that which enabled them to realise their rights, things were hard before COVID. They have lived in lockdown for years. Long before the pandemic, disabled people across Scotland had been living below the poverty line, having their care packages cut and, in effect, their lifeline, and they've been forced to drag themselves upstairs because there aren't enough accessible homes. COVID has deepened that inequality and exacerbated those problems, and I think that is clear for all of us across the Chamber to see. I have said it before from this bench, but it is a point that I think must be reinforced. We cannot go back to that normal. We must go forward to better. To a better Scotland for everyone that lives here. And that must include ensuring that disabled people are included on the journey to recovery. We cannot and should not want to get there without them. We must have them at the heart of all that we do. And it has been said, if you are not around the table, you are probably on the menu. And we only have to look at what is first to go when the going gets tough and who loses out on the most to see how true this is. In the initial months of the pandemic, disabled people made up almost six in 10 of COVID-related deaths. There is no statistic that could highlight the deep inequality facing disabled people more than that. Sadly, though, there are more figures that highlight this too. In the midst of the toughest years of our lives, disabled people have had their care and support withdrawn overnight, their lifeline denied. Their families and loved ones have been left to pick up the pieces and this has broken unpaid carers. 40% of children living in households where someone is disabled are living in poverty. And we know that in many cases, disability benefits don't even scratch the surface of the additional costs associated with being a disabled person. There remains a disability employment gap of 32.6%, and progress to reduce that has been slow. Recent analysis by the Scottish Government itself has showed that the employment rate of disabled people fell by 5.7% throughout 2020. Further analysis by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation has found that disabled people had reported a loss of earnings by the middle of 2020. And as we begin to make our recovery from the pandemic, one in four disabled people are worried about their health and safety at work, especially as workers begin to return to the offices and public-facing roles. We have to change. We all deserve better than this. And that starts by making sure that disabled people are at the centre of our recovery. Deputy Presiding Officer, disabled people are innovative by design. We have to be just to get by. So let's make sure that they're around the table, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because you never know, we might learn something. Decisions about us must never be made without us. And I would urge the government to make sure that they never are. To do this, they have to actively involve disabled people, go that extra mile to make sure that they are around the table, and this means resourcing disabled people's organisations. Disabled people's organisations are way more than service providers, and in fact, usually that is not their main thing. 
They advocate and speak truth to power for a better world. They develop policy, build capacity, support, lead, listen, deliver and fight. Like thousands of other disabled people, they've given me so much. It's not an underestimation to say that they changed my life. It was because of disabled people and the collective action and solidarity of our organisations and of the Labour Party and the movement that I realised that inequality experienced by me was not the fault of mine. I was not broken or wrong. Society was. The inequality that I experienced and that other disabled people do too is the consequence of structural systemic oppression. It was because of disabled people in our organisations that we have rose up and demanded our rights and our emancipation. Disabled people's organisations are life-changing for disabled people, a lifeline for our families, and they're pure gold for governments who want to improve the lives of disabled people, because I promise you, they can tell you how. Deputy Presiding Officer, none of us know what the future holds, but we do know this. Inequality cannot be an option, and we cannot conquer it by, by we have to, we can only conquer it, sorry, by working together with disabled people and their organisations. They've told us for a long time what that future should look like for them. It's a Scotland where social care meets our human rights and our workers' rights. Charges for it are gone and social care workers get £15 an hour. It's a Scotland where equality and human rights are enshrined in law and delivered in practice, including by full incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. And it's a Scotland with a social security system that's there for people in and out of work, that guarantees a minimum income, and crucially, that does so whilst properly taking account of the varying conditions that disabled people live with and the costs they incur. Deputy Presiding Officer, colleagues, if we do these things, we begin to scratch the surface of tackling the systemic, sustained and ingrained inequalities facing disabled people. That's the new normal we in this, must, in this chamber must seek and must deliver. And finally, Deputy Presiding Officer and colleagues, on this International Day of Disabled People, the week of International Day of Disabled People, I want to end with a message to disabled people across Scotland. I promise that for as long as I am in this place, your fight will be my fight. There will be nothing about us without us. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Ms Duncan Glancy. I now call on Stephanie Callaghan, who will be followed by Brian Whittle. I in four minutes, please, Ms Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to Pam for bringing this debate to the Chamber. And I will touch on many of the same points because they are very, very important points to be making. So, while the International Day of People with Disabilities should be a time to celebrate and embrace the many and varied achievements of our disabled brothers and sisters, I'm afraid this year, as we remain in the midst of a pandemic, that most people with a disability will struggle to celebrate. As you've already heard, the theme of, today is inter uh, of tomorrow sorry, International Day is fighting for the rights in the post-COVID era. What a sad indictment that in 2021, disabled people are still fighting for their rights. While the challenges facing people with disabilities are not new, the pandemic has crystallised many and it's created new ones too. Health inequalities between disabled and non-disabled people are stark and they make for grim reading. Six in ten people who die of COVID-19 will have a disability, whether that's visible or hidden. And today, people with disabilities continue to be more likely to contract COVID than the general population. On top of being at greater health risk, the underlying societal conditions for disabled people require an urgent and sustained response. The latest figures in the disability employment gap in Scotland reveal the employment rate of disabled people remained 35.5% lower than that of non-disabled people. Not just now, sorry, I've got a lot to fit in, Stephen. While disabled Scots make up around 20% of our nation's population, too often they still remain excluded from much of society, be it decision-making, policy-setting, employment, culture or sport. Presiding officer, as Scotland continues its journey of recovery, People with disabilities, including disabilities that might not be seen, need to be included in all areas of policy recovery. An ingredient to creating sustainable societies that embrace people with disabilities is to have communities based on the law of equity rather than just the law of equality. And there's an important difference between the two. While equality means everyone is treated the same exact way, regardless of need or any other individual difference, 
Equity means everyone is provided with what they need to succeed. Equity is about levelling the playing field. As a South Lanarkshire councillor, I've had the joy and privilege of working with Councillor Grant Ferguson, who is the first BSL councillor in Scotland. Conducting virtual meetings created great challenges for Grant and our councillors. Well-meant suggestions were, quite frankly, unhelpful and a wee bit rubbish, to be honest. It took Grant defining his own needs to find real solutions, and this clearly demonstrates why the full and direct participation of disabled people is so important. Hence the popular slogan, nothing about us without us. But as we know, change cannot be one-dimensional, and we must challenge attitudes. And the pandemic has presented a real opportunity to make workplaces more inclusive and allow employers to tap into the benefits of a diverse workforce. For example, a person with autism has a neurodiverse mind, a way of seeing the world differently to others. And as my autistic child once said to me, Mum, the world needs autistic brains to solve the problems normal brains can't solve. There's a vast pool of untapped talent out there, people who can help businesses become stronger and more competitive. But only if these businesses are willing to stop seeing someone's disability as a problem and really start viewing it as an asset. Let us show people the strengths and abilities of those persons who have currently been excluded. Let us change attitudes, remove barriers, and treat those of all abilities with dignity and respect. Let us learn from disabled people themselves. In the post-COVID world, we must not forget the idea of returning to how things were before the pandemic really isn't on. We don't want to go back. We want to go forwards towards a more inclusive future and a more inclusive Scotland. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms Callan. I recognise this is a very consensual debate, but I would just gently remind um, colleagues to refer uh, to each other by their full names. And I call on Brian Whittle to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Four minutes, Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I congratulate Pam Duncan for bringing this, uh, Pam Duncan Glancy, excuse me, for bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber and giving us the opportunity once again to, uh, to discuss, which I've always described in here as a misnomer. Uh, I, I've never ever liked the, the term disability. Um, I think my view is that everybody has, uh, has an ability and it's our, it's our job in here to ensure that those abilities, that the route to, to, to achieving those abilities are realised. We have come a long way without question uh, in, 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 in this particular area. Um, obviously I, I uh, will talk about sport at some point during this speech, I make no apology for that. But um, I wanted to talk about the, the, uh, an issue that was raised just there on uh, employment rates. And um, I was asked to uh, go down to I think it was South Ayrshire to discuss, to do uh, to an event with employers, uh, so we could discuss with employers the, the importance of making sure that their workforce is representative of the communities. And also to highlight that the support that's available to employers to ensure that the workplace environment is adapted to those with any kind of disability and of course but the first thing I did was turn to my, 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 my colleague uh, Jeremy Balfour and asked if he would come down with me because how better to demonstrate uh, uh, achievement um, through disability than with, with, with Jeremy Balfour and that double act was of course then born and uh, it's not so much more can be wise he's the funny one um, but uh, it, we were asked down to, to several after that and uh, and now we have uh, Pam Duncan Glancy as well no, demonstrated. No I will give way to Mr Kerr. Thank Stephen Kerr. Thank you, my friend, for giving way. Um, I can congratulate uh, Pam Duncan Glancy on her motion and her excellent speech. Um, but isn't one of the ways that MSPs can practically show our commitment to this celebration tomorrow by actually signing up to become disability confident employers, to commit ourselves to the five commitments of being uh, disability confident employers. Brian Whittle. Yeah, thanks, Stephen Kerr, for that intervention. It, uh, he's absolutely right, of course. And uh, I think in the last uh, Parliament, quite a lot of us did, in, did exactly that to make sure that we uh, uh, not, only, not only walk the walk, but we not talk the talk, but we walk the walk as well. I think it's incredibly important that we, as, uh, as MSPs, demonstrate, uh, demonstrate leadership. Um, I'm going to talk about um, um, sport, obviously, uh, for the next minute or so. Um, I, I think it's, it, we, again, we've come an awful long way. If we look at the Paralympics and how that's developed over the last decade, even, uh, how it's, it, it, it's come forward. It's come much more into the, the public, uh, the public for the forefront of the public knowledge. I think 
uh, London 2012 was a, was a big uh, a turning point for that. And I, I have said before in this chamber, I have I've been extremely fortunate as, as a coach, still still do, to, to have uh, among the athletes that I've coached, I have coached those who have so-called disabilities, that being uh, cerebral palsy, uh, FASD or, or autism. Some are visible, some are not. But what I do know is their inclusion, that positive impact and their ability to participate in their, is, is life-changing uh, for them. Uh, I, I've, I've spoken at the FASD uh, debate in here and, 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 and told then of the young man that I was working with then and how that framework of, of, uh, of sport has actually helped him develop as a person and he went to college and he's now out and, and working and living on his own. And, and, and so it is crucially important that we have the opportunity for all irrespective of background or personal circumstances to participate and it is um, the big issue with me is not so much what what they do what, what those with disabilities do once they get to the sport it is their access to get there and and the one i always talk about is the usher tigers power chair football who have given us lessons uh, over and over again and and how to play that game and the problem with them is actually getting them to training and to, uh, and to competition. So I will wind up, Deputy Presenting Officer, uh, just by saying that, that again, thanking uh, Pam Duncan Glancy for, for bringing this to the Chamber, but ensure that in this, whenever we're de uh, deciding in this Chamber what we're going to do, that access to opportunity is absolutely crucial. Deputy Presenting Officer. Thank you, Mr Whittle. Um, I now call Daniel Johnson, who will be followed by Marie McNair. Uh, four minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. And I'd like to begin my remarks by saying thank you, not just the customary thank you to Pam Duncan Glancy for securing this debate, although I am incredibly grateful that she has, but actually thanks to her and one other member in, in this chamber, Jeremy Balfour, because I'm a, a d disabled person. I have ADHD, and that is not something I'd have been comfortable saying if it wasn't for Pam's support, Pam Duncan Glancy's support, apologies, Deputy Presiding Officer, and Jeremy Balfour's. And indeed, I'll never forget the conversation I had with Jeremy uh, in the garden lobby after I'd stated that I had ADHD. And he said, look, you must tell Parliament that you have a disability. And I wasn't very sure. I wasn't sure I was, quote, unquote, disabled enough. And Jeremy said to me, no, it's important you do, because everyone has a disability. You have to be matter-of-fact and confident in discussing it, because unless you do, you're making it harder for all of us. And that was an important contribution. And Pam, likewise, was very encouraging and reassuring in embracing the fact uh, that I had a disability. And importantly, that's given me ownership, ownership of my own identity, because you can't understand me if you don't understand my ADHD. It is a vital part of how I think, how I behave, how I see the world. And sometimes that's not always terribly easy, but it's easier if I explain what I have and who I am, especially perhaps when I'm uh, blurting out in the chamber when perhaps I should be sitting and staying quiet, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thank you for your patience. But it goes beyond that, because I think it's also critically important that we do talk about those disabilities that aren't immediately obvious, those disabilities which are invisible. Because the one other aspect, apart from just simply, I think, us all having confidence, is that uh, we have to acknowledge that while we've made huge progress in talking about disability, breaking down those prejudices, there is still huge prejudice against those with disability, especially those which are invisible. It is still acceptable, and you will still hear jokes being made where dyslexia is used as the punchline for poor spelling, where social awkwardness is dismissed as someone being a bit on the spectrum, where someone's ability, inability to concentrate is being a bit ADHD. We are one of the groups in society where it's still acceptable to make us the butt of a joke, to be casually dismissive or prejudiced against, and that has to stop. We also need better understanding. Just today, we heard um, people being stigmatised for taking medication. Well, I took my medication this morning, and I'm not going to apologise for it. And we need understanding that some people need medication to overcome their disability, to help them with their disability. And I'm thankful that I have that possibility, because my brothers and sisters with autism don't have a prescription they can take to help them with their invisible uh, disability. And, and, and I am grateful for the ability to take mine. And indeed, if you want 
uh, an understanding of the stark reality of, of these disabilities, every single one of the groups that are included within neurodevelopmental disorders is overrepresented in prison. A people with ADHD, five times more likely than, those, uh, than the general population to be in prison. People with autism, twice as likely. People with dyslexia, three times as likely to be in prison. There is no greater sign of the injustice happening against people with neurodevelopmental disorders than that uh, statistic. So we can't go back to the new normal. Pam Duncan Glancy is absolutely right. We need better understanding, we need to break down those barriers, and we need to break down the prejudices that still exist. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Johnson. I could just clarify that um, an explanation of an intervention from a sedentary position will not be considered a justification for it. Um, I also note that I've got my work cut out getting people to refer to each other by their full names, but uh, I take that in the spirit of this uh, debate. And I call Marie McNair, who will be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Ms McNair, around four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to speak in this important debate to mark International Day of Persons with Disabilities. I congratulate Pam Duncan Glancy for securing this member's debate. As one of her colleagues on the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, I see firsthand her determination to ensure that the needs of disabled people are listened to. Today allows us, on a cross-party basis, to show our support for this annual event. The theme this year is fighting for the rights in the post-COVID era. I welcome this theme and straight away as a member of the Parliament's Social Justice and Social Security Committee, I am reminded of the evidence we recently received from the Glasgow Disability Alliance. They were clear that they believed that the pandemic has supercharged the inequalities they faced and has created new ones. Glasgow Disability Alliance correctly point out that listening to the voices of disabled people will be vital to ensuring that the recovery leaves no one behind. So this debate gives us all the opportunity to say that we hear that message and that we will listen to disabled people when we make our decisions. I am very supportive of this approach and it is my long-standing view that disabled people massively enhance our country and should be involved in shaping its future. My view on this has been positively enhanced by my volunteer work with adults with additional support needs, which be began in my teenage years and my employment as a support worker in the heart of my constituency, and I would draw members' attention to my register of interest in my previous employment. As MSPs, we owe a big thanks to Inclusion Scotland for the excellent briefing they have produced for this debate. They are clear in that briefing that disabled people have been hardest hit by COVID-19, and they also stress that disabled people want to move forward and not back. They want to do that as leaders and full participants and help create a more inclusive future. This Parliament must unite in agreement with that approach and we have made good progress as part of the Dignity, Fairness and Respect agenda as we redesign Social Security. That redesign has rightly involved disabled people and their experiences are vital to avoid the future failures of the past. So, for example, we have vehemently rejected the use of private sector assessments in the harsh conditionality regime that has been at the heart of Westminster's system of disability benefits for many years. Once we have the safe transfer of cases from the DWP to Social Security Scotland, we will continue with this much needed redesign. Unfortunately, that harsh assessment regime remains for universal credit and legacy benefits. And we also see benefit sanction levels creep up again from their closing down during the pandemic. So we must continue to call this out and not let disabled people in Scotland be subjected to a two-tier system of social security. But it's not just social security where we take an approach that listens to disabled people. This must be how we make decisions across the whole range of services we provide in Scotland. So around health and social care, education, housing, transport and our green recovery, we must listen to the voices of those who can help us shape a way out of the pandemic that is fair, just and leaves no one behind. Presiding officer, in closing, I take this opportunity to thank all the groups in my constituency that su support disabled people and are led by disabled people. There is a real strong community spirit across Claybank, Bearsden and Mogai, and I promise they will continue to be on their side in this parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McNair. I now call Jeremy Balfour, who will be followed by Paula Kane. Four minutes, Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, like others, I want to first of all thank Pam Duncan Clancy for securing this debate. It provides a valuable platform for us to 
commend the work of those who have gone before us on these issues, but also look forward to the progress that is yet to be made. I'd like to thank my colleagues from across the Chamber who have given up their lunch hour to come and engage with the issues surrounding disability. Even though disabled people make up 20% of the Scottish population, it can often feel like they are secondary concerned to other issues. And so I'm grateful too and encouraged by those who have come to participate. I'm also happy that I'm no longer able to say that I'm the only person in this parliament who openly identifies by having a physical disability as I was in the last session. It is inarguable that we have benefited greatly from the election of a more inclusive parliament and I look forward to further progress being made in elections to come. Deputy President Officer, even though these great strides have been made, we are still not at a destination of a truly inclusive parliament. There are still barriers that must be broken down, both in a material sense, but in the context of our attitude to disabled issues. And that brings me to the point I would like to make clearly. We do a great disservice to disabled people by lowering the bar too far, too much for them. Viewing a person's specific disability as indicative of their wider ability is something that is very common and is very destructive. We should not lower the achievement bar beyond what is reasonably simple to bestow good feelings on those with disability, or as in often the case, ourselves. Often we are best encouraging and at worst forcing disabled people to settle for a life which they do not fulfil their potential or pursue their dreams. Far too often we make the assumption that just because someone can't do some things, then they can't do anything at all. This is clearly not the case. In reality, displayed in the fact that the disabled people who have succeeded in a wide range of sectors. We should be encouraging everyone, regardless of disability, to strive for the best they can be and do and support them in their efforts. Now, of course, Deputy President, we should be pragmatic in this endeavour. It would be dishonest to acknowledge the fact that there are limitations that disabled people experience that inform the extent that they can progress in certain fields. For example, it is very unlikely that I would make a good brain surgeon, probably not the area that I should be working in. But that doesn't mean I cannot look at other areas where I can put my energies into. So while identifying limitations, they should serve only as guidance towards each individual. It should never be something that should stop people realising their dreams and excel in their chosen field. I will conclude here, President Officer, by once again applauding the progress that we have made in the past, commending my colleagues across the Chamber to see the potential in disabled people and to realise their dreams and to help facilitate them as we come out of this worst 18 months many of us have faced and look forward to a brighter, better future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Balfour. I now call on Paul O'Kane, who will be followed by Maggie Chapman. Again, four minutes, Mr O'Kane. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to be able to contribute to today's debate, indeed as convener of the cross-party group on learning disability. Uh, and I want to thank my colleague and friend, Pam Duncan Glancy, for securing this debate as we mark the International Day of Disabled People tomorrow. And I also want to pay a wider tribute to Ms Duncan Glancy uh, for all the work that she has done over many years, and indeed already in the short time that we have both served in this Parliament. And I think on this 2021 International Day of Disabled People, it is important to recognise uh, that the Chamber looks different since the last International Day was marked in 2020. Parliament has changed to become more diverse and to increase uh, the number of MSPs who identify as having a disability. And may I praise Daniel Johnson, my colleague and friend again, for his very powerful and personal speech. Uh, and as someone who knows something of speaking your own truth uh, every day, and, and whether that's in this parliament or anywhere else, it is a, a very brave and important thing to do, uh, not only for yourself, but for other people as well. And I think Jeremy Balfour's advice on that is very solid. 
speak the truth, even if your voice shakes. And indeed, Jeremy Balfour, I think, made a characteristically powerful speech also. Um, and he was a great help uh, to me in a former role as Secretariat of the Cross-Party Group on Learning Disability in the last Parliament. Of course, this Parliament includes our first ever permanent wheelchair user in Pam Duncan Glancy. And I want to quote some of uh, Ms Duncan Glancy's maiden speech. She said, For too long this Parliament and others like it have not looked like the people that it is here to represent. But this year is different. The people of Scotland broke glass ceilings and glass staircases, and this room got a bit closer to looking a bit more like the people of Scotland. It is now our chance to turn a little hope into lasting change, because this is the room where it happens. Those are powerful words and worth recalling today, because we know that we have much more to do to make our Parliament look like our country and to ensure that the voices of disabled people are heard and listened to. As we certainly. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, I'm grateful to remember. Would the member agree with me that often it's not the Parliament that has to change, but actually it's our own political parties across all six parties within this Parliament that need to change? Paul Kate. I, I would certainly agree with Jeremy Balfour on that point. And, and all of us in political life have a duty uh, within our political parties to find the ways that we can encourage more people uh, from a diversity of backgrounds to, to join our political life. Because very often, politics is off-putting for people because there are barriers there about how we deal with one another, how we respond to one another. And very much so, I think political parties have a role to play and a bigger role to play. And I hope that we all take cognizance of that. Um, you, you know, decisions that we make in this place impact the lives of disabled people every day, of their families and of their communities. And I want to focus my remaining time on this year's theme, which is fighting for the rights in the post-COVID area uh, of leadership and participation. For too many disabled people, the past 20 months have been an absolute battle to have their rights upheld, protected and advanced. Too many have seen care and support removed with little or no consultation. Too many have been cut off from family, friends and their social life. Many have been pushed further into poverty. And tragically, six in ten deaths from COVID-19 have been those who are disabled. And we know that people haven't felt consulted, engaged or involved when COVID-19 regulations have changed. And I reflect on my own experience of working to support people who have learning disabilities and their families in the first lockdown. Regulations didn't always fit the many complex and different challenges people experience on a daily basis. The fact that autistic children couldn't visit the beach that they go to every week, which for them is a haven because it was in a different local authority just down the road. Many people didn't feel able to engage and understand in what was being asked of us all because of a lack of accessible formats like Easy Read. And for too many, far too many, their lives were viewed as worthless as blanket approaches to do not resuscitate was taken. And I must commend my colleague Jackie Bailey, the former convener of the cross-party group and the vice convener, uh, former MSP Joan McAlpine, for bringing that matter to the fore in the last parliament. And there are still serious que questions which remain to be answered. Deputy Presiding Officer, I will conclude by looking forward. A single day of awareness, raising and celebration will not solve the problems that disabled people face. We must learn the lessons of the past 20 months and we must do more. And we must always ensure that the voices of disabled people ring loud and clear in all of our considerations in this place and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr O'Kane. I now call on Maggie Chapman, who joins us remotely, who will be followed by Christine Graham. Four minutes, please, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank Pam Duncan Glancy for securing this debate and giving us time to discuss what more we can do. And there is much more we should do to ensure that Scotland achieves equality for every single one of the 20% of Scots who are disabled. I also want to thank all those individuals and organisations who provide support, advocacy and so much more to disabled people across Scotland. Households with a disabled person experience a relative poverty rate 6% higher than the general population. Disabled Scots are less than half as likely to be employed as non-disabled people. In 2020-21, disabil disability hate crime, not including crimes going unreported, rose 14%, and they have risen by over 600% since 2010. And the Scottish Household Survey tells us that disabled people are more than twice as likely to experience loneliness as non-disabled people. These facts say a lot about the depth and breadth of disability inequality in Scotland. In almost every way it is possible to think of, 
disabled people can be and are discriminated against, overlooked and disadvantaged. For too long, disabled people have borne the brunt of cuts to our social security system. Just a few weeks ago, tens of thousands of unemployed disabled Scots living on low incomes had 20, 20 pounds a week cut from their universal credit payment. But with about one in 10 Scots claiming one of the devolved disabilities, we have a truly golden opportunity to advance equality for disabled people. Our social security system in Scotland is built on the idea that social security is an investment. Indeed, the Scottish Fiscal Commission projects that spending on the new adult disability payment will eventually be over half a billion pounds. It also predicts an extra 40 million pounds of consequential payments to carers of disabled people. It is absolutely right that this happens, and I am proud that Greens were central to this. But getting to this point has taken years of campaigning by disabled people, by organisations that represent them, to highlight the damage done by PIP and other cuts. Countless protests outside job centres, hundreds of thousands of appeals, hundreds of thousands of lives. And so disabled people, their voices and their experiences must be at the heart of our new system. In particular, the forthcoming review of disability benefits must be led by disability benefits recipients themselves and leave nothing that might increase support and access to support off the table. Before I close, presiding officer, I would like to touch on the impact of climate change on disabled people. Last year, the UN published a landmark study into the impact of climate change on disabled people, presenting evidence that disabled people are more likely to be left behind during evacuations and emergency information is not always accessible. Earlier this year, extreme heat in Canada saw huge numbers of people with mental health conditions being treated for and some sadly dying of heat stroke, as drugs used to treat certain mental health conditions can cause reduced heat tolerance. Worldwide, disabled people experience poverty at more than twice the rate of non-disabled people. And we know it is the world's poorest people who experience the most severe impact of climate change. Yet the Glasgow Climate Pact contains just a single passing reference to disabled people. Inclusion Scotland, which organized the first ever disability-focused event at a COP summit, said the agreement was, and I quote, very disappointing in relation to active involvement and participation of disabled people in climate action. Without proper involvement of disabled people, well-intentioned measures to tackle climate change, plans to build a new society, attempts to properly support vulnerable people, will further marginalise those who need the support most. We must ensure that in all we do, disabled people are front and centre with their voices heard, not just in debates like today, or on the International Day of Disabled People tomorrow, but every day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I now call on Christine Graham, who will be followed by the final speaker in the open debate, Monica Lenning. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I congratulate Pamela Duncan Glancy in securing this Timmy's debate, a force to be reckoned with, and thank goodness. I note we've come a long way since the Oxford English Dictionary of Disability as, quotes a person who is unable to walk or move properly through disability because of injury to their back or legs. That was first used as long as 950 AD. Today, under the Equality Act 2010, you're disabled if you have a physical or mental impairment that has substantial or long-term negative effect on your, on your ability to do normal daily activities. This recognises, as does the motion, that many disabilities are invisible. Many decades ago, when I was a secondary teacher, I don't think we were aware of issues like autism. We might have had autistic children in the class behaving strange. We had no idea. I have to confess, however, I find the term disabled sits uncomfortably with me, as it can be construed as having pejorative undertones, and I don't know how we move away from that. But there have been improvements in my lifetime in the perception and the provision for those with impairments, not simply, though importantly, in the equipment to assist, but in recognise the importance, indeed the obligation, to ensure it's a level playing field for work and life at large. Now, I'm not just talking access and hearing loops, but seeing beyond the disability to the person. You know, it's not many decades ago when our society hid some with disabilities, even locked them up, and certainly did not go out of its way to make accommodations. And there are too many parts of the world where it is still a struggle, even Dickensian. 
But I'll start with this building, which during this construction, it was ensured that those with impairments were in at the beginning. So we have braille signs, disabled access, almost to some of the lift locations, and I'm sure the member has found this out, are simply in daft places. Ramp access in the chamber had to be adapted, but we have a hearing loop system, though I recall, as I say, some alterations had to be made even after the Parliament was built. Regarding the selection of candidates for this place, certainly in the SNP, endeavours are made to ensure that those with disabilities are not disadvantaged, are indeed encouraged to go forward as candidates, and on our regional list system, we ensured if anybody was on that list with a disability, they automatically went to the top. And I'm not talking patronising, because I absolutely agree with everything that the member said regarding there's not to be patronising. What there has to be is assistant rules to just fulfil their potential, whatever it is. I want to remind you, however, we had Dennis Robertson in here with his wonderful dog, Mr Q. Staff fought over the right to walk him, even at his own pass. And woe betide you if your speech was boring, because Mr Q had a very loud snore, bigger than any critique from other candidates. I want to talk about changing perceptions briefly. I recall an episode of Frost, the detective series, when two young actors with Down syndromes portrayed a couple with Down syndrome falling in love and wanting to get married, and the prejudices that exposed for parents and for society at large. I think that had a big impact. Again, Brian Whittle mentioned the Paralympics, which I've spoken in before. I think that's made a difference to perceptions of disabilities. When some folk would turn away from looking at an amputee, it's quite ordinary now, and I believe it's had a lasting impact, in particular, I believe, for children who share these disabilities. Then lastly, Strictly Come Dancing mentioned at FMQs, when I, which I confess I watch Whiskey and the Cat. That's my Saturday night sad story. But I saw Rose Aylan Ellis dancing so beautifully that I clean forgot she's deaf. As a result, a huge increase in those wishing to learn to sign and what an inspiration to others with a similar impairment. Conclusion. Politicians, yes, can change life for those with disabilities, policies, legislation, and these are important. But in my book, it's those popular programmes and events which give that extra push to equality and change societal perceptions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Graham. I can confirm that Mr. Q's sedentary interventions were perhaps explicable, but weren't encouraged either. I call on Monica Lennon, the final speaker in the open debate, around four minutes, Ms. Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I also want to congratulate Pam Duncan Glancy on securing this debate. Um, I'm really pleased that the Parliament has the opportunity to recognise the UN International Day of Disabled People 2021, which we know falls tomorrow. Um, and because I'm the last to speak in the open debate, um, I can say that all of the speeches genuinely have been really excellent. And I, I think a whole range of issues have been covered. So I've been scoring out things that I was going to say because they've been said already. Um, but I'll maybe add a, a further a few issues. And I think the Cabinet Secretary will be busy after today speaking to lots of colleagues because we can see already that the, the issues being raised are, are very much cross cutting and we do need to have a, a joined up approach, not just for the government, but for, for um, all um, employers and agencies and others across Scotland. Um, at the start, I will declare an interest in this debate as the patron of disability equality Scotland, a voluntary role that I'm very honoured to hold. Um, so I want to maybe talk about a couple of things that maybe haven't been um, fully covered today. Um, toilets, I want to mention toilets, Disability Equality Scotland poll their, their members every week and their membership has increased during the pandemic. 95% um, of disabled people responded to the recent Disability Equality Scotland survey to say that they have changed their plans because there are just no uh, suitable toilets available. Um, so if that doesn't spell out exclusion, I don't know what does. Um, I want to pay tribute to former MSP colleague Mary Fee, uh, and, and also Jeremy Balfour for all the, the great work they did in the last session um, to champion uh, change in place toilets. I know the government has announced in the last term more funding, which is really welcome. Uh, but from looking at my inbox, people want to see uh, mo more delivery and, and more change in place toilets rolled out. So I think that's important work to, to, to bear in mind. Um, 
Also, um, I'm going to talk, talk about transport, but linked to toilets. Um, one of the respondents to the, the recent um, Disability Equality Scotland poll said that lack of suitable accessible toilets on long distance buses is a, is a real issue in Scotland, um, saying most, uh, sorry, the worst offenders are long distance bus operators. Toilets on those buses are useless. That's a direct quote. Um, also, um, others saying, you know, rural areas where a hospital appointment journey can take several hours, not having access to a suitable toilet is obviously a, a real problem there. And, uh, you know, in, in restaurants and, and, and some pubs, accessible toilets um, are still being used for storage. You know, cleaning products are being kept there and then taken out when a disabled person wants to use a toilet and then put back in. That, that's really offensive. And you know, today's debate really is about, about dignity and human rights. So we need to do better than that. Um, on transport and I suppose town planning, another issue close to my heart and, and really about access to the built and natural environment more widely. Um, Disability Equality Scotland, again, do really important work on access panels. Um, access panels, for those who don't know, are groups of disabled volunteers who work together to improve physical access and wider social inclusion in their local communities. During the, 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 the scrutiny of the planning bill in the last session, some of us tried to, to get a, a statutory recognition for access panels in the, the planning process. I think that, that is work that still needs to be looked at by, by the government. But again, that, that's also about access to inclusive communication, so that discussions with planners and also with transport providers um, is, is fully accessible. Um, there's a, about two seconds left. The, the other T I wanted to mention was around treatment and access to health care, in particular for chronic pain patients who feel that their care has been further deprioritised during the pandemic. Hidden disabilities like, like migraine, we really need to improve um, treatment. And just finally, um, in conclusion, presiding officer, in, in, in their briefing to, to members, Inclusion Scotland have said that policy and decision makers and service providers have the best resource possible to get things right. That is disabled people. We've heard today disabled people know what is needed. They know what works and what doesn't. It's responsibility of all of us uh, to, to listen and to make sure that we break down those barriers, we get that system change. And I hope that both this government and this parliament will be ambitious and bold to deliver that system change that disabled people require. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Lennon. I call on Shona Robeson to respond to the debate. Cabinet Secretary, in seven minutes, please. Thank you uh, very much. And can I join others by thanking Pam Duncan Glancy for securing this debate and to all the members who have taken part in what I think has been a really good debate and for sharing views and aims for the future, suggestions, all important ahead of this year's International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And as mentioned, the, the International Day this year focuses on the importance of the leadership and participation of disabled people for an inclusive, fair, accessible and sustainable post-COVID world. And it's encouraging, as others have said, to see that this parliament itself is more diverse than in previous sessions, as noted by Jeremy Balfour and also Paul O'Kane, who also reminded us, though, that there is more uh, to do to ensure that this parliament truly looks like Scotland. And this is a key moment, I think, for us to recognise Scotland's own champions for disabled people's rights, equality, inclusion. Obviously, the uh, members in here who have done a tremendous job, I think, of breaking down barriers and showing what can be done, but also disabled people's organisations who play a vital role in representing the diverse views and experiences of disabled people across the country in urban, rural, highland and island communities. And this has been particularly crucial during the pandemic, which has had considerable impacts on disabled people. I want to offer uh, my thanks to all of those uh, working in the DPOs and the wider third sector for their invaluable contribution to supporting people during this very difficult time. And the Scottish Government is listening to uh, disabled people's lived experience and experiences and trying to, to work to ensure that collectively we build resilience in our communities so that disabled people can realise their rights and get on with living uh, their lives. And Pam Duncan Glancy was right to say that uh, people with disabilities should be around the table. 
And I agree with that. We don't always get it right. And I think it's important, though, that we, we must. One of the foundation stones of this approach will, of course, be our new Human Rights Bill, which will bring the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities into Scots law as far as possible within devolved competence. And this will place a, a greater impetus on public bodies to remove barriers and support disabled people to fully participate in society. And I think will help to empower disabled people, enabling them to claim and, importantly, enforce their rights. And this follows the work that we did in the previous Parliament in taking the Convention as the blueprint for our Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Delivery Plan. Our next plan for action, which we'll publish by the end of 2022, will build on this and it will reflect on what has and hasn't worked so far as we progress towards a Scotland where the Convention is meaningful in communities, services and opportunities. And through our Equality and Human Rights Fund, uh, we'll invest £21 million in funding over three years to advance human rights, promote equality and tackle discrimination, with over £5 million of this funding going to disability-focused projects and organisations. Now, as is importantly mentioned about the disability employment gap, and we are committed to reducing that by at least half before 2038. Now, real progress had been made before the, the pandemic, but the disruption of COVID-19 slowed the pace of change. So we're working with uh, disabled people's organisations and, importantly, employers to reinvigorate this programme of work. And we'll also establish a scheme to tackle the barriers faced by disabled people who wish to take on leadership positions, empowering more people to fulfil their potential. As uh, others have mentioned, uh, the, the role of our social security system is important, um, and it's important that it treats people with dignity and respect. And the, the redesign um, mentioned uh, by Marie McNair uh, is important, and the fact that it involved disabled people in that redesign was critical. And of course, we will be piloting our new adult disability uh, payment early next year to replace PIP, and the new initiative will be trialled as part of our transformation of disability assistance, during which we'll transfer the entitlements of nearly 700 thousand existing disability and carer benefits clients from the UK government systems to Social Security Scotland, a big, a big thing in itself, a massive undertaking. As a first step in July, uh, we launched our new child disability payment in three pilot areas to provide vital support to 38,000 children and their families in the next financial year alone. And of course, we'll double the Scottish child payment in April uh, of ne next year. And as well as building people's economic resilience, we have to ensure that disabled people have access to the right support uh, and care. And that, again, has been mentioned by a number of members. We know there's a lot more to do to ensure that everyone can rely on having access to the right care in the right place at the right time. So we'll continue to engage with disabled people's organisations as we start to build the new national care service, uh, which I think has the potential to revolutionise the delivery of support uh, to people uh, when they need it most. Now, Monica Lennon also mentioned accessible toilets. And uh, as she mentioned, we're investing £10 million to increase the number of changing places toilets across the country, including mobile facilities at events and outdoor venues. And facilities that meet our needs are something that most of us take for granted. And fully accessible toilets, of course, are important for dignity, confidence and peace of mind. So there is more to do in that area. I just want to mention briefly young people and, importantly, the Young Persons Guarantee. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, disabled young people get access to that. And we're wanting to help to connect more than 1,000 disabled young pe people to fair work, education and other activities. And of course, we've made a commitment to introduce Scotland's first national transitions to adulthood strategy in this parliamentary term to ensure there's a joined up approach. And of course, uh, note uh, Pam Duncan Glancy's um, a proposed bill on disabled children and young people's transitions into adulthood. And of course, we share the same ambition for improved outcomes and are supportive of the intentions of the bill. And we're engaging with uh, Pam Duncan Glancy around that and met just yesterday as part of that. I also just want to end with a, a couple of reflections. I thought um, Daniel Johnson's speech was a very, very powerful one and actually recognise that many people in Scotland live with unseen or hidden disabilities, including 
autistic people and people with a, a, a range of disabilities for whom there are particularly stark inequalities. And that's why we've committed to a, a dedicated programme of work detailed in the learning uh, disabilities and autism towards transformation plan. And part of this commitment includes our work over this parliamentary term to introduce a, a dedicated learning disability autism and neurodiversity bill. Just to close, um, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, by just taking a, a moment to appreciate the crucial role of our allies in the journey to disability equality, all of those who have shared their lived experience, uh, colleagues in this parliament, and creating much needed change, that societal change that Christine Graham talked about for all disabled people, enacting as role, role models, real role models and inspirational leaders. We thank them for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this session of Parliament until 2.30.